taking government off your backs and turning you loose to do what you can do so well. Thank you very much. The idea that the new self-actualizing individuals would choose a politician from the right, not the left, seemed extraordinary. But to test their prediction, the Values and Lifestyles team did a survey of voting intentions, and they correlated it with their new psychological categories. When we said uh, in our surveys, who are you going to vote for, sure enough, it was the inner directives who said that they would vote for Thatcher and for Reagan. And they made the difference in those elections because of their, their voting for Thatcher and Reagan. And it really surprised our colleagues, even within my own organization. It really showed the power of this approach because it's very difficult to identify inner directives on the street. These people who voted for Thatcher and Reagan, these inner directives, came from any walk of life. It's really hardly correlated with social class at all. I mean, if you just go along and look at age, sex, social class, uh, you would never pick them up. But if you, if you really go along with a questionnaire that gets at their values, then you can identify them very easily. And that was new? And that was completely new, yeah. At the beginning of 1981, Ronald Reagan was inaugurated as president. But he took charge of a country that was facing economic disaster. The terrible inflation of the 1970s had destroyed much of America's traditional heavy industries. Millions were unemployed. But true to his campaign promises, Reagan told the country he would not step in to help, as all previous governments had since the war. These United States are confronted with an economic affliction of great proportions. We suffer from the longest and one of the worst sustained inflations in our national history. Idle industries have cast workers into unemployment, human misery, and personal indignity. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. But America's ailing economy was about to be rescued, not by government, but by the new groups that the market researchers had identified the self-actualizing individuals. They were about to become the motor for what would be called the new economy. You can be what you want to be. So regarding V8, what do you really want? <sighs> A tasty product that's good for me. What do you want that for? One technique is that we ask people the same question over and over and over again, and we say, what do you want? What do you really want? What do you want that for? And they start to talk about it, and they kind of get intimate with what's going on. What we're doing with that technique is unpeeling the onion. If you want to think of a person kind of having layers and layers and layers of protection and thoughts and behaviors and beliefs, we want to get to that center core. In the wake of the invention of values and lifestyles, a vast industry of psychological market research grew up. And the old technique of the focus group, invented by the Freudian psychoanalysts in the 50s, was used in a new and powerful way. The original aim of the focus group had been to find ways to entice people to buy a limited range of mass-produced goods. But now focus groups were used in a different way, to explore the inner feelings of lifestyle groups, and out of that, invent whole new ranges of products, which would allow those groups to express what they felt was their individuality. And the generation who had once rebelled against the conformity imposed by consumerism now embraced it because it helped them to be themselves. What capitalism managed to do that was brilliant was to actually create products that people like me would be interested in, that people like Jerry Rubin would be interested in. Capitalism developed a whole industry at developing products that evoked a larger sense of self. That, that, um, that seemed to agree with us that the self was infinite, that you could be anything you wanted to be, that, that took our philosophy and agreed with it and then created products that supposedly helped you, AIDS, that helped you be this limitless self. The product sells you a, a way of life, a way of being. The product sells you values. You, you dress this way, you live in a house like this, you, you have furniture like this, you use this computer. Have you had regular jeans? Or? Oh, Gloria Vanderbilt uh -huh. does a lot in denim, in silks, and in cotton. You eat in these restaurants, 
They have values there, hipness, coolness. This is not, I repeat, not a marketing scheme. So the notion that you could buy an identity replaced the original movement notion that you were perfectly free to create an identity. And you were perfectly free to change the world and make the world anything you wanted it to be. Well, what I wear is um, a statement. And this vast range of new designs fitted perfectly with changes in industrial production. Computers now allowed manufacturers to economically produce short runs of consumer goods. The old restrictions of mass production disappeared, as did the worry that had bedeviled corporate America ever since mass production had been invented, that they would produce too many goods. With the new self, consumer desire seemed to have no limit. In the United States, the concern of companies was always that supply would outstrip demand, that we were, we were producing too much, and that there was not a market for it. You don't hear that kind of talk anymore because you've gone from a conception of a, a market of limited needs, and if you fill them, they're filled, to a market of unlimited, ever-changing needs dominated by self-expressiveness. That products and services can satisfy in an endless variety of ways and ways to change all the time. And consequently, economies have unlimited horizons. Out of this explosion of desire came what seemed a never-ending consumer boom that regenerated the American economy. The original idea had been that the liberation of the self would create new kinds of people, free of social constraint. That radical change had happened, but while the new beings felt liberated, they had become increasingly dependent for their identity on business. The corporations had realized that it was in their interest to encourage people to feel that they were unique individuals and then offer them ways to express that individuality. A world in which people felt they were rebelling against conformity was not a threat to business, but its greatest opportunity. It was, in a sense, the triumph of the self. It was the triumph of a certain self-indulgence, a view that everything in the world and all moral judgment was appropriately viewed through the lens of personal satisfaction. Indeed, the ultimate ending point of that logic is that there is no society. There is only a bunch of individual people. Uh, making individual choices to promote their own individual well-being. Next week's episode tells the story of how politicians on the left, in both Britain and America, turn to the techniques developed by business in order to regain power. But what they didn't realize is that what had worked for business would undermine the very basis of their political beliefs they would find themselves trapped by the greedy desires of the new self.